Thank you for having joined this week for our Side by Side. And I hope you've enjoyed these and find help in these last few days as we've thought about a new song or a song for Thomas. I'm not sure whether you've been downcast, but I know we all get downcast from time to time or we meet others who are downcast who have no song to sing. And uh, it's really sad, isn't it, whenever we discover that in our hearts. It's normal and it's natural. And if that's where you are today, let me encourage you by saying that this is not something strange. There are times when all of us feel we find it hard to sing songs, good songs, the Lord's songs. Thomas eventually, well, according to the sort of tradition, and that's where I'll go, because there are no actual records that would have the authority, for example, of Scripture. But various historical records and traditions indicate that Thomas travelled by sea to India in 52 AD and that he was later martyred and buried there after witnessing to the people in that area. The tomb of St. Thomas is in Mylapore in India and one of the poets, St. Ephraim, recorded in his hymns and poetry that Thomas worked miracles in the Indian city of Edessa. Another Syrian ecclesiastical calendar has an entry which reads, The 3rd of July, St. Thomas, who was pierced with a lance in India. His body is in Edessa, having been brought there by the merchant Cabin. And so there is this tradition in Edessa honouring Thomas, calling him the Apostle of India, and many other accounts and traditions mention Thomas in connection with India. And so we have good reason to believe that this Thomas who is sometimes called Doubting Thomas, I think, unfairly, uh, went off with a new song in his heart and really did good work for God and lived out his days in faithfulness, singing a different song. But going back to this passage, which is where we've been these, these few days, and hasn't it been good not to rush all over the Bible? I think it's really good sometimes just to spend time and go deep into it. It's like getting the chicken bones and kind of maybe kind of licking all the fat off them and getting the best out of them in a sense, if that's an analogy that that you understand. It seems that Thomas did not respond to the invitation, first of all, of Jesus to touch the wounds of his hand and side. Let me read this. Jesus comes and he stood, um, stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. You see, I think as you read that, it seems to me anyway, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that Thomas didn't actually put his finger out or his hand out. I think he had seen enough. The fact that Jesus comes and stands before him, the Jesus that he has spent three years with, the Jesus that he has listened to, the Jesus who broke bread and fed it to him along with the others, the Jesus who has called his name, he now sees for himself. And this is the one he recognises, not in some spiritual way, not in some erythral way, but the real Jesus as physical, hears his voice, he knows his voice, he sees him and he recognises him. But what did it put into his heart and into his mouth? Surely it's incredible. It put into his mouth these words, my Lord and my God. Now, maybe having read those two words in the past and having heard them before, they don't have a big impact on your eye. But try to bring yourself all the way back. In this gospel record, they have never been used in this way before. This is the first time that the gospel records the name of God as given to Jesus in this way. And Jesus accepts it. Jesus doesn't put his hand out and say, oh, no, no, sorry, you're going too far there. No, he receives this worship. He receives this praise. And Jesus is affirming, you're right, Thomas. I am Lord and I am God. But secondly, let's pause for a moment and notice Lord and God. Let's think about those two words because they are really heavy words. Oh, they are the heaviest words in the whole universe, really, when you think about it. Because these two words, these two titles given to Jesus, indicate that the very God of the universe is standing in human form before this small group of men. The same God who spoke and and, and every tiny particle of life comes into being. All of that DNA in its, in its amazing intricacy and majesty is formed in this world. 
And there he stands. And there creation bows before him. What an amazing grace to care about one weak and troubled man and to make available to him the very answers to his questions. Put out your finger. Put out your hand. And he's no less, this Jesus is no less to you and I. And so when he uses these words, my Lord and my God, as we pause and think about those words, not just the word Lord and God, but the word my, that possessive word, Thomas owns Jesus as his Lord and God. And when we can move from Lord and God as objective, yes, Jesus is, to my Lord and my God, things change. This is now a personal confession. It's not just a confession. And personal is everything. It's not so much the personal of ownership. You know, I own that, that's mine. No, no, it's the personal of relationship. And we have a new relationship with Jesus. Just as someone might say, my child, my husband, my wife, they're not saying that they own them, but they are saying that they have a special relationship with them. There's something uniquely wonderful about that bond that is there. And so when you pause a little and think about those two words, that's a few thoughts to maybe get you going. But I leave you to work on a little on that in prayer afterwards. But thirdly, what are the implications of this? To call Jesus our Lord and our God is to see ourselves as belonging to him, yielded to and submitted to him, worshipping him and loving him. If I could pull in the words of an old chorus from my childhood, he is my everything, he is my all. I'm sure you may remember that. Uh, Maybe not. If you're younger, you'll never have heard it. But that's the a line from an old chorus. And I think that's what Thomas is saying. My Lord and my God, he's my everything. It means my life is under his rule, his gracious, loving rule. I'm going to listen carefully to him and he will speak in and through his word to me and I will hear his word as from my Lord and my God. So when I hear it, I'll be saying, this is God's word speaking to me. My God, my Lord. That means I need rest in his rule over all all for my good because he is the Lord of love and the God of grace. He could never desire anything but my good. And it means I will no longer try to be God in my own life, running it my own way for my own purposes, but I'll wait for his direction. And then finally, just to mention, we can touch the Lord by other ways than finger or hand. Isn't that right? the finger of faith and the hand of faith, because Jesus concludes this little session by saying, blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. That's you and I. It's us. No, we haven't seen Jesus physically, but he has made himself known to us in other ways. He certainly has made himself known to us in scripture, in nature or creation, And in providence, which is his working out in history, we see the work of God moulding history to suit his purposes. And we've seen him working. Many of us have seen him working in our own lives personally, in response to the prayers of others and our own prayers. By his spirit, he's at work in us, so that now we do not call out my Lord and my... Sorry, not we do not. We actually do, sorry. We do call out my Lord and my God in worship and prayer. So, we end this week with this challenge to us, our confession and our song. He comes to us as we seek him. That's one of the great things we've been learning this week. He really comes to us as we seek him. Just as Thomas expressed his words, unless I put my fingers, unless I put my hand, I will not believe. Even though he's not saying, please come and reveal yourself to me, Jesus, Jesus comes. He shows himself to us in scripture and then we join the blessed and we can rejoice in being the blessed. That is, blessed are those who believe no matter whatever else is occurring to us in our lives today. That is something that's really, really true. So I would just encourage you, read over this little section again, just a few verses that we have reflected on. And pray through this, and I pray that God will give you a new song to sing, 
Even singing the old song with new joy or new peace, or even singing it when you don't feel like singing it, keep singing it, because the joy will return. So thanks so much for having spent these few days, and we'll catch up next week. I don't know where we're going yet, but as you pray and I pray, the Lord will guide us to something that is just completely what we need. God bless.